Chris Mannix, ready to joust with me, is joining us on the show. Did you hear J-Mac last week? Mannix was up in Boston, and he and Eddie just taking these subliminal shots at us because we have questioned late-game efficiency by the Celtics. I will acknowledge they were pretty good late against Chicago, and my eyes were there set on I'm glad that 70 games into a <laughs> dominant season, one trip to Chicago to watch them <laughs> and watch Jason Tatum has you sold on this team as a legit contender. Well, I have said they're going <laughs> to roll through the East. I don't have any question, and I do think they're deeper than Denver. I do like to go every year I go to a couple games, and there is a different perception when you go to games. My takeaway was, and it's always been with Tatum, I know he's great. I've said, all NBA, got no problems. Uh, late game stuff, take it over. And okay, uh, Chicago's more talented than people think. They actually have real NBA players. They're young in spots, but they have some players. The one thing I saw with Tatum, first guy out at 5'10", first guy out on the floor, both teams working hard, like first guy by like 25, 30 minutes. The second thing was, in the late game situation, he wanted the ball. He just like, give me the ball. And there's also, and I kind of knew this, but there is a gap in this league, as you know. Outside of Steph Curry, think how smart the Warriors are run. They don't have another guy that can give them 25 points. Yeah. Tatum is clearly in an elite class of, give me the ball, I'm always going to get my shot. Yeah. That was very clear in that game. And I think, with that said, I may be uncomfortable at times, but I don't think Boston's uncomfortable with anything about Tatum. No, they, they're satisfied with him being a distributor at times in those situations because he has the horses to throw the ball to. I mean, Jalen Brown has closed the gap, I think, this year even more between himself and Jason Tatum. Chris has Porzingis averaged 20 this season. Drew Holiday has proven he can make big shots in big moments. If you don't have an open look or if you don't have the play that you want, passing the ball is the right play. And look, the criticism of Boston over the last few weeks really has boiled down to is Jason Tatum a closer? And you know this. You can find stats to back up any argument. And I've seen some of Jason Tatum's, you know, the clutch time stats aren't as good as some of the top tier guys. How about the eyeball test? How about we go with that? Like, yeah. did I fall asleep last year during the conference semifinals when Jason Tatum went off in the fourth quarter of an elimination game yeah. in game six? Did I miss that game seven against the 76ers when Tatum went for, what, 51 yeah. in that game. The three games that the Celtics won against Miami, Jason Tatum scored like 85 points in those three games. And I'm convinced he would have had a breakthrough performance in game seven if he didn't get hurt on the very first play of that game. So this idea that Jason Tatum is somehow on another tier of clutch player than some of the other guys we regularly talk about, well, to me, is ridiculous. Well, the other thing I will say about Tatum is Luka doesn't defend. Tatum does. Yes. He I has gotten measurably better no over question. the last few years. Yeah, so th the other thing is, unlike Biggs, Tatum doesn't get hurt much. He's there every night. So there are a lot of things. Um, you know, I mean, some of this is jousting and it's fun. But I did want to go see him in person. <laughs> so I saw him in person last year. And I do. I like to watch guys in person, see the body language. Jason's a very confident guy. And the one thing that really is so true when you watch the Celtics play, there's so much culture. Golden State's got a lot of this because it's a lot of the same guys. Boston has this too. Al Horford is a classic example. Boston's ball movement, you know, Chicago's young. Now, Andre Drummond's not young. DeRoz, but there's a lot of young guys. They're perpetually rebuilding. When you watch Boston in, in, in crisis moments, end of the clock, end of the game, their ball movement, you can tell these guys have been in a lot of practices mm -hmm. together. And a Derek White, a lot of guys that don't get pub. So I, I just thought it was interesting to me watching without three starters, and yet the backup guys, it's like they practice with the ones all day. Their ball movement, I thought, was exceptional. Well, yeah, and, and this is the paradox of you right here, where part of you <laughs> wants Jason Tatum to go one on three, to be, you know, Jordan in the 80s and yeah. just go after it every time he has the ball in clutch situations. But you just named Derek White's another guy who makes big shots and is comfortable in the moment. 16 a night, nobody pays attention to it. Everyone knows that if Derek White is open or if Drew Holiday is open, that is a better shot than Jason Tatum getting a soft double team thrown his way that forces up a contested two. He makes the right plays every single time. That's not always going to manifest itself in a game-winning shot, but it's going to manifest itself in an assist or a hockey assist 
or something that gets it done. Jason Tatum all season long has made great plays for this team. So I was saying in my opening rant is... Uh, By the way, can we just... Can I also... Nick Wright. <laughs> who, what, you're picking on who, who likes to take shots at my support of the Celtics over the years. Nick Wright, the LeBron advocate general for so many years of everything LeBron does and is great and nothing. He There's no reason not to want to play with LeBron James. We used to argue on First Things First all the time about whether Anthony Davis was better off being traded from the Pelicans to the Lakers or the Pelicans to the Celtics. What would you say about that right now? Because AD does have a championship, but he's probably got three, four, or five more years left in the NBA. Wouldn't you say he's probably better off playing with Jason Tatum, playing with some of those guys in Boston than he is in L.A. long term? Well, I think the Celtics have since Brad Stevens first got the job. I think I look at Boston and I think to myself, this is a very well-run, consistent franchise. Very Warriors-like. The difference is Steph just hits, you know, Steph just is one of one. Uh, and Tatum is very good, but Steph's like a unique unicorn all time. Yeah, I think Boston, and, and, and I've said this before, I think the Lakers are actually like a, a small town business in a big market. That's sometimes how they've been run. So, yeah, I think 80 to the Celtics probably would have been a better fit. Well, let's cut that and send that to Nick to use this <laughs> afternoon. Um, so I want to talk about the Warriors because it is fascinating about the NBA. So since he came into the league in 2009, the Warriors, well run. Everybody misses on draft picks. I mean, you get almost no video of these guys in college. You have mm -hmm. no, I mean, it's ridiculous. And, uh, NFL GM gets four years of tape. I get like six games where you played against an NBA guy. I think it's really hard to draft. Really hard to draft as an NBA GM. 22 draft picks since Curry's been there. Multiple dozen trades acquisitions. They are still a totally dependent Steph Curry mm -hmm. offense. Do they have to blow it up? I think they have to go get somebody. We've seen this now for three years. Now, one year, you know, Denver wasn't quite ready to go. LeBron and AD were unhealthy. But I just feel like, guys, you got to go get somebody, right? They are completely dependent on Steph Curry to score in key situations. Every night. I mean, that game, like, look, look, we can talk about the two most recent games with the Warriors, which, which I thought were bad for different reasons. Uh, last night against the Timberwolves were bad because – they had a lead for most of the game. They had a lead going into the fourth quarter. And S Steve Kerr decided Steph had played too many minutes the night before, gave him an extended rest. That lead evaporated. They were down, I think, eight at one point in that fourth quarter because they can't score without Steph Kerr. You go to the, uh, the Indiana game, which was the previous one. They put up 111 points against Indiana. Indiana is not a good defensive team. That's a team that doesn't have shot makers anymore Steph Curry still a shot maker but has to do it in somewhat of a reduced role because of his age and the desire by the coaching staff to keep him as rested as possible down the stretch but beyond Steph who can you count on on a nightly basis to make up the difference to to pick up the slack Clay Thompson not doing it anymore Kaminga I like him a lot but he's not capable of that just yet they don't have the horses right now to compete with the number of teams out there that just have shot makers left and right that can make shots. So a lot of people are um, predicting that it won't be a great playoff because Boston's going to fly through the East, which I agree with, although Miami is a weird way of making them uncomfortable. Mm. The coaching's excellent, Bam, Butler. They'll, they'll make things uncomfortable. Um, and then that Denver is dominant. Um, Phoenix is disappointing, doesn't necessarily match up, and that Denver's not that fascinating. I love watching them play. But I said this last week, what's really interesting to me is Milwaukee because they're old. They don't defend as well. Once they left Drew Holiday, they didn't want to get rid of him. It's a Hail Mary. They had to get somebody and they got Bane. They, they love. I don't know. They didn't want to get like I, 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 I would love to give them truth serum to ask if they would have made that deal. if They knew Drew was going to wind up in Boston because I thought they assumed he was going to wind up on a Western Conference team, and they wouldn't have to deal with him, at least not in the conference playoffs. So he's clearly, with, with his departure, they're just not as good defensively. Yeah. You can't argue that. And I think Giannis has been Westernized. Not a criticism. He's a little more caustic. He's running through, you know, that coach got fired. The coach he wanted, Adrian Griffin, got fired because Giannis was tired of it, even though they were the number one or two seed when he got fired. Mm -hmm. And my takeaway is, if they lose early, 
or if they play Boston and they do not match up with a cell, that could be a sweep. They don't match up athletically with Boston, I don't think at all. They don't match up well with Boston, but I was at the game last week where it was very close down the stretch with the Celtics. And yes, the Celtics were playing without Holiday, and there was probably a letdown for them going into that game because Giannis was supposed to play, then he didn't play, so it wasn't the matchup they thought it was. But watching Damian Lillard grind out 30-plus points in that game, watching Chris Middleton continue to show signs of progress coming back from that injury. He's going to be a dangerous weapon for them. Almost had a triple-double last night in the Bucks game. Watching Bobby Portis step in and play well for them. They did all that. Kept it close against Boston in Boston without Giannis on the floor. And the Bucs like to say no moral victories. I walked away from that game thinking that it was a moral victory for them. So I agree with you. I would take Boston in a series against Milwaukee. I do think it's a lot closer okay. than let people me are saying. Let me make this argument that if they lose to Boston, they have got to take it six or seven. Because if it's five games, three lopsided losses, my take is Giannis looks at that roster and goes, they're younger and more athletic. We're older, less athletic. We're not getting younger. I think Milwaukee has to be viable, has to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. I would agree with that. I, I think getting to the Eastern Conference Finals is the absolute floor for this team before they have to get worried about what Giannis is going to want to do long term. Look, the contract extension Giannis signed was more about securing his financial future right. than it was about a long term commitment with Milwaukee. And I talk to NBA executives all the time that tell me there are teams out there just sitting on him, just, you know, crossing their fingers, rooting against the Bucks <laughs> every single game. Teams like the Knicks, the Warriors, the Lakers that are just sitting there hoping that this team bows out early and Giannis decides, look, this isn't for me. But if they get to the conference finals, it's hard to, if they make it competitive against Boston, you can't blow it up. You can't because you still have enough pieces that are in their prime. Damian Lillard's still back end of his prime, but playing well enough, all star starter in his prime. Chris Middleton, if you can just coax one full healthy season out of him, he is still an effective player. The front court guys, Brooke Lopez, is ageless on that team. I don't think you can blow it up if they go up, up against Boston and lose in six or seven. If they get beat by Miami in the first round, not out of the realm of possibility, by the way, but if that happens, then I think it's a different picture. Chris Mannix. Well, you, you, no, what, 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 did you just say that if they get beat by the Heat in the first round? I think, you don't you think, think Miami can't beat Milwaukee? Miami is the classic mm. lurking in the shadows as a sixth seed. They've been doing it for a decade. You, you know, overvalued. I mean, there's a team last year. They made a great run. They looked exhausted all season, Chris. I, I don't see it this year. Okay. Well, look, they've had a lot of injuries. They have all also. season long. And yeah. I think they're a lesser team this yes. year because of some of the deals that they made. The guys right. they lost in free agency last summer. But I promise you, you talk to any coach in the they NBA. They don't want to face them. Right? Nobody First wants to face them. Nobody, like, what are they sitting? Eight seed right now? Yeah. You know, they'll be in the play -ins. They have to fight their way through that to get there. And they almost lost almost the play-in last exactly. year. Like, they almost got beaten the play-in. So yeah. that is certainly on the table. But if they get through, and if they're the seventh seed, and Milwaukee's sitting there at number two, that would make me nervous yeah. if I was the Bucks. If they're fully healthy, and they're, they get a couple of play-in wins, or whatever it is, yeah. I, I would and look I feel the same way about Boston Boston doesn't want to touch them in the first round either because a healthy Jimmy Butler a healthy Bam out of bio Duncan Robinson actually been better this year than he has been last year more complete player uh, Tyler Hero coming back that is not a team anyone wants to touch that's radioactive in the first round well listen I, I've said this people can say what they want about the Lakers when they won the in-season tournament and it was sort of a one-game setting, it's like you don't want to face LeBron in one game setting. No. You don't want to face LeBron as a heavy favorite. LeBron, I'll make this argument that AD is now the third best center in the league. Jokic is just the best player. Giannis is a better athlete. But Anthony Davis for a year and a half has not gotten hurt. Mm -hmm. He is there every night. He's an unbelievable defender. Three out of four games, he gives you big offense. I was banging on him for two years. Anthony Davis has had a remarkable year and a half stretch. He has. He's um, one of the only guys that makes Jokic work. Now, Jokic will get his, hmm. but he makes Jokic work. He does. And those games, as have been well documented, are incredibly close. Between The, the Lakers game. don't win them, but they've been incredibly close down the stretch. His durability has been one of the most surprising stories 
of the last couple of years. His ability to stay on the court, yes. be an elite defensive player, where he still malfunctions from time to time is offensively. Yeah. Offensively, he'll have maybe too many nights where he gives you like 10 points and yes. it's a low shooting percentage. That makes you worried if you're the Lakers because you don't have a lot of reliable options after him. But in fairness to AD, when you're leaning on a 280-pound guy and you're a great defender, I don't think offensively, you're not Luka. Luka just mails that side in. Yeah. When you're asking AD to defend guys that are often bigger, I think and it wears... The like that, that's the problem. With, one of the problems the Lakers have had this year is that they don't have anyone they can rely on to play those five-spot minutes. Like Jackson Hayes hasn't really been that guy. Yeah. Christian Wood hasn't been that guy. They haven't had that one big that can give them 20 minutes of reliable production alongside Anthony Davis. Hi, everybody. It's me, Uncle Colin. Subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more, wherever you may be, however you may be watching. Thanks again for making us part of your day.